Welcome to First in Future, Connecting in Crisis, a weekly webinar from the Institute for Emerging Issues at NC State University. We thank you for joining us for this morning's show where we're gonna be focusing on one of the least talked about and most important emerging issues during this pandemic, the mental health challenges that it is creating. We're gonna talk about what's happening with those challenges. How do you know if you or someone you know needs help? Where do you go to get help? We extend our special thanks to Lowe's, the home improvement retailer for their sponsorship of today's program. I'm Leslie Boney with the Institute for Emerging Issues at NC State. And if you'd like to know more about us, we ask that you go to emergingissues.org. We thank you for joining us today. This is the ninth in a series of webinars that we've had focusing on the critical implications of the global pandemic for our education, for our work, for our government, for our nonprofits, for all of us. Each week, we try to look at three things. What's happening? What are the data tell us about where we are and what we're hearing? Second, how do we get out of where we are and back to something sustainable? And especially now that we're beginning to get some perspective, how do we think differently about what we've been doing? Can we come back stronger and better than we were before? Is this an opportunity perhaps for some sort of change over the long term? Today, we want to talk about one of the issues you've told us you are most concerned about during this time, mental health. This is Mental Health Awareness Month, and it really couldn't be better time. There is growing evidence that during COVID-19, good mental health is getting harder for a lot of people to have. We want to hear from you. For those of you listening on Zoom or Facebook Live, welcome. We'll be communicating with you during the webinar using the chat function. We ask that you lift up your thoughts and concerns and questions either there or through the Q&A function. Those are both available at your bottom toolbar. A reminder that all the slides from today's program will be available on our website, emergingissues.org. And if you want to see a, want a friend to see the show a little bit later, we'll post the taped version on our website on Friday, May 15th. But we want to get straight to the topic with our guests, and we are honored to have them. Dr. Kerry Brown, who's the Chief Medical Officer for Behavioral Health in the Department of Health and Human Services for the state of North Carolina. Dr. Kate Knudsen, Chief of Behavioral Health for Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. And Dr. Mark Grimmett head of the Community Counseling Education and Research Center based at NC State College of Education. Dr. Brown, let me turn to you for starters, just for a quick overview. Last week, we were talking with Supreme Court Justice Sherry Beasley, and I asked her if there are reported incidents of domestic violence were going up, and she said, surprisingly, not really. And that was in part because right now, a lot of those incidents are going unreported we know about mental health challenges during this time? Is there data that's beginning to show up or is that a lagging indicator? So there, there is some early data that is beginning to show up. I do think we're sort of at the beginning of, of seeing the impact um, of this pandemic. And I think it'll be unfortunately with us for, for a while. Um, really, this is an extraordinary event. And so um, it's really pretty normal to have increase in stress and anxiety and difficulty sleeping and disruption of routine. Um, we are very concerned about uh, suicide and domestic violence and child abuse um, and increase in substance use disorders. I think those are all of the concerns um, that are at the forefront. I, I do think there's probably a lag in, re in reporting. Um, and what we really want to do is just get the message out that people it's okay to reach out for help and that there is help out there. And because um, I think there are a lot of people that I don't want people struggling in silence in this. And, and, and we really um, at DHHS are, are wanting to reach out. It is, it is challenging because it's very different, um, you know, but we're trying to make things much more available by a telehealth. Um, and we, we can talk a little bit more later about some of the crisis lines that are available to link people with services and some of the initial data on calls to those crisis services. But I think in reality, um, and in past pandemics, you know, it, it can take you up to six months before you even really start to see what's going on. Um, so I think this is, we're at the very, very beginning. Dr. Knudsen, from your standpoint, anything showing up in insurance data or claims that are coming in that suggests that 
that there is a spike or there is something meaningful that's different about this month versus last month versus the month before? That's a great question. Um, so in general, we have about a three month uh, lag before we see the, the difference in claims. However, what we're seeing that's very encouraging is a major uptick in the use of telehealth for um, treatment of behavioral health conditions. So as you know, we transitioned very quickly at Blue Cross North Carolina to, um, to paying for telehealth um, for a wide variety of services. And we've seen a major uptick in the in the use of the uh, of switching to telehealth for behavioral health, which is fantastic. Dr. Grimmett, you've made a pub pivot of your own from from face to face services mm -hmm. to uh, the free services that you offer uh, to folks primarily in Southeast Raleigh who don't have uh, insurance that covers mental health treatment. Uh, how did you make that conversion? Well, we made the conversion primarily based on the needs of our clients. So prior to the pandemic, we were seeing uh, about 130 clients per week in person at our um, on-site centers. And after that, the needs that our clients had did not change. So we had to make an adjustment. Prior to the pandemic, we had not anticipated really um, providing distance counseling services. That was not in our uh, service provision at all but um because we didn't because of our ethical responsibilities and the mission of our center we needed to find a way to provide those services and fortunately we had several graduates of our counseling program who were currently practicing distance counseling and one of my former doctoral students who <laughs> just recently graduated has her own practice with um telemental health and our dissertation was about how to provide clinical supervision to counselors who are providing distance counseling services. So all those things worked to our advantage and we were able to get our staff trained fairly quickly and to transition into providing distance counseling services. All right. Well, thanks to you all for being with us. We're gonna spend some in-depth time with each of you in turn and then we'll come back together at the end. In the meantime, I just, lift up to people that you do have an opportunity to ask your questions via the chat or Q&A function, and we'll look forward to getting that. So I want to set just a little bit of a context for uh, the next part of the discussion just by uh, sharing some data that uh, those of you who don't follow this issue may not be up to date on. And uh, these, are, these are sort of broad numbers, and these are national numbers that you're seeing on the screen right now. But uh, in normal circumstances, roughly one in five adults experience some sort of mental health issue. Uh, one in 25, about 4% of those are considered serious, uh, defined as serious. Uh, in normal times, again, uh, roughly one in seven people with mental illness are uninsured. And uh, this is an important statistic that I think we'll probably get into a little bit later. Even during normal times, uh, it is, uh, a lot of people are reluctant to get treatment. So I think it's 48.6% of people in the U.S. that have mental health challenges don't get treated for them. So even if they have insurance, there's some reluctance to get treatment. Uh, Dr. Brown mentioned earlier uh, some findings on loneliness. We'll take, take a look at a slide sort of summarizing that, but there's been a steady uptick in uh, what uh, Angus Deaton and uh, Deaton and Case both call deaths of despair over the past few um, over the past few um, years, and if we take a look at that, you'll see a steady increase in uh, suicide, other deaths of despair. Uh, former Surgeon General Murtha and others have linked loneliness uh, over time to early death. And from past disasters, there's some data that suggests that people who go through a pandemic like SARS or H1N1 uh, could well be diagnosed with something resembling uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So in many cases, uh, PTSD is considered a secondary effect and predicted to be a secondary effect of this crisis that we're in. So we don't know exactly how things are going with this crisis yet, as all three of our panelists have already mentioned. But what we do know is that we have some early glimpses of what's going on post-COVID. 
um, there is some early evidence uh, that just came out last night, actually from Gene Twenge in California, who takes a look at uh, what happened when she used the same methodology that the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics does to uh, screen for uh, mental health challenges. And what she found in a survey of about 2000 people uh, conducted late April is that roughly 70% of them were screening positive for some sort of mental health challenge. That's about three times what you would normally see. 28% uh, screen positive for serious mental health challenges. That's a multiple of maybe seven times what you would normally see. And what she found was that the highest increase was among 18 to 44 year olds. So let me turn back to Dr. Brown and just ask about that. You, you've seen the Twingy data. Uh, I was talking with Scott Zelnick from uh, Cape Fear earlier, and he said, it's confinement, disruption, stress of health and money, all combining with uncertainty to increase anxiety and depression. Then you add time to the equation. We're living in close quarters. We're not seeing friends. We've lost jobs, facing an uncertain future. What sort of challenges does this create for people who may not have had previously diagnosed conditions? What do we need to be on the lookout for? Well, I so I, as I sort of said before, I, I think it, it is incredibly normal. I mean, this is such an extraordinary event. It's incredibly normal to have some pretty significant stress in response to this pandemic, which is clearly what the data is showing, is that, that everyone is, 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 mental health is under pressure in this um, and trying to figure out how to adjust to, to this new world. And so, you know, I, I think that Given that, um, it, you know, all kinds of self-care become so much more important. And, uh, and actually one of the hopeful things is that people can learn new techniques for their self-care. And some of it is um, things that they, they may not have tried before. So for example, like breathing exercises to help with anxiety. Um, we know that diaphragmatic breathing, for example, and there's, I'm not great at demonstrating it on uh, TV here, but uh, you can, but there's plenty of videos on YouTube. And what's so cool about it is it, it, it connects into our natural physiology um, where it triggers something called the vagus nerve, which then sends powerful signals to the rest of the body to um, relax. And it actually you know, decreases heart rate. Um, and so something that I've been personally practicing quite a, a bit um, in this pandemic, just to sort of reset. Um, so, but the things that where people need to worry is if, you know, if you're really not getting a little bit of disruption in sleep is normal, but if you're really not getting sleep, if you're, if you're starting to have suicidal thoughts, if your, um, your irritability and anger and your, and sort of um, a, aggression with family members is, is increasing. If your use of, of illicit substances or alcohol um, is increasing, these are all things that, that maybe your, the stress is, is taking its toll. And, and the most important thing is that people reach out. Um, one of my hopes uh, is that the opportunity that this pandemic has given us is to have an incredible stigma busting um, event. The entire world is experiencing stress and anxiety and depression and the opportunity for empathy and for understanding um, others with, with mental health conditions is there if we choose to take it. What are some of the system challenges of COVID-19? Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> um, and in fact, um, I don't know if we want to pop up my first slide. Yeah, we'll show that. So, you know, as we've been saying, behavioral health, is, and as all the panelists will, um, you know, will agree, behavioral health is just core to someone's overall health. And this pandemic is an extraordinary event. It's, it, it, it does have the potential to worsen anxiety and depressive disorders, um, just due to a general lack of control and social isolation. And it, and it also can precipitate anxiety and depression in individuals that don't pre haven't previously had mental health um, issues, but because of the extraordinary sort of isolation. And, th and there's good research that shows that quarantine 
um, has this impact on, on individuals. Um, there's also the difficulty, the challenges, is, as Dr. Um, Knudsen said, we're, you know, we're really trying to shift. Um, certainly in the public sector, Medicaid uh, has done an amazing job, in, 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 in my opinion, of sort of shifting this oil tanker quickly to, change, to make the system work in a telehealth sort of format. And, and we've been happy to have partners in the private sphere like Blue Cross Blue Shield that have, have really pushed telehealth. Um, but there's still challenges with that, right? We know that our state, there are about 700,000 people in North Carolina that don't have access to broadband. So it's great to be able to do two-way audio video telehealth, but if you don't have access to broadband, then that's not accessible to you. And, and that is one of the reasons why the department also activated telephonic, um, all kinds of telephonic therapies, uh, individual and group and et cetera, because we know that um, access to, to telehealth is, is, is not where, where it needs to be. But, um, but I, I actually believe this event will get us there. The other thing is that you know everyone there's obviously an economic economic impact for everyone, um, but a lot of our behavioral health and intellectual and developmental disability providers in the state are are really small businesses, and this this is an incredibly stressful time for small businesses to keep afloat. There's also staffing challenges um, for our state operated facilities um, and for direct care providers in the community um, because of quarantine and other things. So, so there's some significant uh, challenges. That The key has been communication, 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 <laughs> um, increasing flexibility wherever we can. Um, so increasing the mode of, of treatment, by telephone or, or two-way audio video telehealth, um, pushing in funding um, into the system. And, uh, and next slide, please. Oh, did you have another question? I'm sorry. Well, um, let's let's just remind people that this is important for everyone. Um, the importance of wearing a face mask, of re remaining six feet apart, and washing your hands. I think that's important every time we talk about this subject. I do have another question though, and and that's about something you alluded to earlier. So we know that when it comes to the physical health consequences of COVID-19, low income and, and people of color are especially vulnerable to uh, the infection itself. Is there any evidence that they are more vulnerable to mental health challenges? Um, well, certainly we know that, that financial stress um, and just in general sort of socioeconomic status does, does Increase your risk for mental health challenges, right? Because you just you just have more stressors. So whenever there's more stressors, there the 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 there's an increased risk for uh, for mental health disorders or and and also um, not having. And what I'm mostly worried about is not having access to the treatment. There are good treatments available, but we have to. But it has to be accessible to everyone. And and for example, we are not a Medicaid expansion state. And, and we really need to be <laughs> Medicaid expansion state because everyone needs to have access to care. And um, we will have more uninsured in the state as people lose jobs, as the economy is, is struggling. And we really, at, at the department, are very focused on how do we continue to give individuals access to behavioral health care as part of that. A lot of people right now for all sorts of medical conditions are not seeking treatment, figuring that it's it's better to just uh, not see a, a doctor right now because they're nervous about going to a doctor's office or getting out mm -hmm. of the house. Do you anticipate as we move into phase two and phase three of this that there's going to be an inadequate supply of people who can treat those who have been kind of sitting on mental health challenges? There's, what does that look like? A concern. Yeah, something we've been thinking about. Um, you know, one of the things that the, the the pandemic has highlighted key challenges in our behavioral health system, and it's really underscored sort of the need to address those challenges. I am quite hopeful that our push, this rapid push towards telehealth, will actually increase access um, and 
And so, because it allows, um, it, in some ways it's just more efficient, right? We, we know that we have a shortage of behavioral health providers and a shortage of, of psychiatrists, but if you can have a psychiatrist be in one location and see people across the, the state without having to do all that travel time, you, you really, you, it's, a, it's a workforce multiplier. And we really, um, we've had a shortage of behavioral health providers and particularly psychiatrists in the state for quite a long time. And, and one of the strategies that we really have to embrace is telehealth, um, again, because it is such a workforce multiplier. You had one more uh, bit of information that I wanted people to see and just have you talk about, and that is some of the resources that are available. Uh, this is uh, yep. sources that people can turn to if they have questions or concerns or just want to reach out. Can you talk about these services? Absolutely. So we have two statewide 24-7, um, 365, um, all available to anyone living in North Carolina. So anyone in North Carolina is welcome to call either um, of these numbers. The Hope for NC is designed to sort of help individuals um, in, that are in crisis and um, build some resilience and, and link them with longer term behavioral health services. And we also um, have launched a Hope for Healers line and that's because of a recognition of the extraordinary stress on our essential workers. And that's not just healthcare workers, that's individuals working in grocery stores, that's, that's our childcare professionals. Everyone that is on the front lines is under extraordinary stress and um, this is, been, we have a wonderful partnership with the North Carolina Psychological Foundation, and this can link um, individuals with professional treatment. And again, it's all free. Both of these numbers are free. So I encourage people to, to write these numbers down. We want them, we want people to use them. Um, that's, what, that's what they're, they're I and mean, we try to make it as easy as possible. So it's one number. Um, All right, and we've shared those numbers in the chat and we also will have those slides available for, for anyone listening, whether you're live or listening on tape. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Knudsen, you talked about the pivot that Blue Cross has made to permitting uh, telehealth and wondering how you've, how you've been able to get the word out to clients that that is available. Yeah, so we, we have covered um, telehealth for uh, years. <laughs> I, I actually, I, I don't even know how long. Um, what's different here is that we are covering telehealth for an expanded array of services um, and then also covering telehealth. Usually it, it requires a video component. We've switched over to also allow um, telehealth by only telephone only, no video component, um, given the extraordinary circumstances that we're under. Um, and then we have, we've done Lots of different outreach around, um, you know, through our website, um, directly contacting members um, through social media to try to get the word out to, to, to patients and to members so that, um, you know, they, first of all, like you were just saying, don't, don't forego your medical care right now. There is a way to get medical care in a safe way. Um, and, and then also to help not only um, patients be able to stay at home, but also the, the physicians and the, and the providers um, to be able to provide care in a, in a safer manner. In some communities, I mentioned earlier that roughly half of those who have, uh, who are accessing services, uh, who have mental health challenges actually choose to access those services. So on some level, there's still a stigma and perhaps in yep. some communities more than others to seeking services. And Dr. Brown mentioned that this could be a pivot time. Yeah, okay. People are uh, a little bit more open-minded about that or it's more accepted. Do you see this as, as a potential pivot time for people in North Carolina oh. to realize that mental health challenges uh, are something that, that everyone can experience and need treatment? Yeah, that's that's the hope, and I, I, I it was really well articulated by Dr. Brown. Um, yeah, we we have this opportunity where um, we are under we're under an international trauma, and we're all experiencing it. We're all going through it, and so there is this opportunity to be more open and 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 honest and acknowledge the the incredible stress that we're under, and then also potentially with these efforts to put out you know, information about how to access care, how to, how to seek treatment. Hopefully people will be inclined to, to, to make that change and, and take that chance to actually um, receive care. 
I think the other important thing when we look at those numbers of of, of reasons for access, you know, that that you know, less than fifty percent of of our of our population actually that needs care actually receives it. You know, there's so many barriers that um, that are um, included in that. So stigma is definitely one. There's you know, logistic barriers like transportation and, you know, trying to schedule an appointment. There's insurance barriers. Um, there's, you know, time off work. There's so many barriers that we need to address. Um, but but this is a major opportunity, again, through reducing stigma potentially, but then also by making care more convenient and more accessible to people through through telehealth, potentially where we've where we've really lowered at least two of those of those myriad barriers. Definitely overcomes the geographic challenge. I mean, historically, one of those right. has been that mental health is geographically concentrated in a few places and not available at all in other places for face to face. And now, with um, remote access um, more clearly available, I think it it makes it clear that uh, you can access those services. Yeah, and I think you know we have had a uh, we as a a state, a nation, a, a world have had, we have a limited supply of behavioral health providers, um, therapists and, and prescribers. Um, and, and we've tried to overcome that limited supply. And it's, you know, we've done things like loan forgiveness. We've done a lot of different, you know, incentive programs and we really have not been able to, you know, um, uh, move that move that needle. And so what, what I like about telehealth and there's lots of programs that have demonstrated that, um, that through telehealth, you can make a make more efficient and better use of those limited resources. So there, for example, there are telephone consultation programs where, um, you know, uh, and we actually have one new in North Carolina, um, where primary care providers who are treating um, children, these are these have also been um, done also in adults, um, with with behavioral health issues could call in to a regional hub where there are, um, you know, psychiatrists and therapists to help guide that treatment. So, so while, again, you have that limited resource of a psychiatrist, potentially through these telephone um, and other video methods through telehealth, you could extend that research resource over a broader um, geography. Question over chat uh, about whether you see this telephonic consultation con continuing post-COVID. Is that something uh, that you see continuing? Um, potentially, We're, we we are reevaluating um, every month about about what uh, what what con what to continue, and it's all sensitive to the need. One issue, um, to be frank, is that you know the research literature is pretty clear that you know um, behavioral health care that's delivered by video, so over like a teleconferencing line with video is as effective as in person. There's less research on telephone only. Um, and, and honestly, just from, from the clinical perspective, I gain a lot of the exam by just looking at someone's face and their, and their you know, how they're, how they're you know, dressed and groomed and, and all of these things. That feeds into my clinical evaluation. And so if I'm trying to do that evaluation by phone, I'm missing a major portion of the actual exam. And so that that aspect of, you know, we want to make sure that that the care that's being delivered is, is effective and in line with the best research guidelines as well. I want to just show before we go on to Dr. Grimmett, the, the overview slide that you sent about uh, Blue Cross's response to COVID-19, just so people can see the different ways you've been thinking through the challenge. Uh, it's the one labeled Blue Cross Blue Shield NC response. And you've mentioned most of these things, but it's just a, a good quick summary of, of ways that, that you've been tacking and, um, and adjusting. Yeah, so we tried to think about, so we took the approach and actually very similar to what um, our state DHHS has done. We really tried to take the approach of, of the, the person at the center and also the provider at the center. What, is, what, a, what, a, what are our members gonna need in order to receive um, health care um, safely and effectively. Also, what are our providers going to need in order to be able to deliver that safe and effective care? And so that's where we, we really pushed on things like um, expanded telehealth, um, reducing the, the patient or the member's um, um, need to pay for some of these services. So you always have a copay or a cost sharing. We, we, waived, we waived those um, cost sharing me measures um, for treatment of coronavirus. Um, very much need to refill medications early. 
um, and then and then also um, um, re reducing prior authorization. So we know that sometimes that can create a bottleneck, especially if our hospitals were to be overwhelmed. And so we reduce some of those prior authorization requirements to to allow um, more efficient um, throughput through the healthcare system. Thank you. I also wanted to show uh, something you sent beforehand uh, called how to get behavioral health services. It's just kind of a quick summary yeah. that complements what Dr. Brown showed. So this is um, the uh, slide following this is uh, focused on uh, just some easy resources that you can you can get. Um, so it's under the yeah. uh, how to get behavioral health services. This is one that we're seeing now. Yeah, so this is our um, this is where um, um, members and providers can get more information on um, on telehealth for behavioral health services during this time. Um, the other important point is that especially for behavioral health, um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that you're asking for behavioral health service related to coronavirus. We want any behavioral health condition during this time where we have this stay at home order. We want people to keep getting their behavioral health treatment in this um, in this more safe way. And so it applied, you know, not only to, to behavioral health issues related to coronavirus, but really just any behavioral health issue where we really want the patient and the provider to be able to stay at home. Right, we'll come back to you in just a minute. I wanted to turn to Dr. Mark Great. Clement. Uh, who's the um, at NC State's College of Education and runs a counseling center that serves low-income folks that are not covered uh, for mental health challenges uh, through traditional insurance. Mark, in 2016, Wake County, the county where Raleigh is, looked at community health needs and identified mental health and substance abuse treatment as top needs for residents in the county. How'd you get the idea to start a free counseling service? What gap does it fill in normal times? Well, it's been a need for ever, and it's been a dream of mine since I started NC State. So the goal here, in light of that 2016 study, which is reflective of years before that as well, is for everyone to have access to world-class mental health care. And being at a research intensive university that also has a focus on community engagement, we have an opportunity to create a model to um, meet these needs for the community. Now I have, I am a licensed um, psychologist and I'm also a client. So I've had the experience of providing services to community members as well as receiving services from the community and counseling. And what I noticed is is if you don't have insurance or you don't have money, the quality of care goes down significantly. Mm -hmm. And so at the university, we partnered with, with our community to figure out those needs and try to provide services that would be on par with people who do have insurance or who have a lot of money. And the reason we're able to do that is because we have students, master's students and doctoral students who are completing their degrees in counseling and counselor education and as part of their training we can provide the services that the community needs at the same time the big difference that i want to point out here though is that we're operating from an ideal so we're not limited by like um, having to provide a diagnosis in order to get reimbursement we're trying to use the best theory and the best practices that we are that we're aware of and put those in practice immediately so it's, it's not hard, Leslie, to kind of find out what those needs are when you go out into the community and ask people, it's, 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 it's quite apparent. And we're trying, to, we're trying to come up with a solution and that's, that's part of how the center developed. So these are some statistics from the folks that you serve compared to the rest of Wake County, the folks you work with are in normal times, three times as likely to be poor, three times as likely to be high school dropouts, 50% more likely to be unemployed, are also disproportionately African-American. And we've seen that COVID-19 is disproportionately hitting lower income communities and communities of color harder when it comes to getting the disease. Does poverty matter in your mind when it comes to mental health? Absolutely. Poverty matters with everything, but certainly matters with health care. And we're talking about access to the basic things you need to live your life. So uh, I think it, it, it absolutely matters because when you don't have the resources, it's hard to access the services that you need. 
But I do want to point out one thing, though, particularly as it relates to this pandemic that I hadn't thought of sharing, is that one unique thing, and, and it was in your slide earlier, is that people who are accustomed to having everything that they need um, are experiencing a, a great shock that might not be as severe for people who are used to navigating the difficulties of life. And that doesn't mean we don't need to provide those resources to people who are who um, need them most. But what I've noticed is that like the inconvenience of not being able to hang out with your friends or uh, do some of the things you normally do with your life, that is not the main issue. Those are not the main issues that are coming up with the clients that we're dealing with. They're more worried about um, losing their jobs and, and being evicted from their homes and the stress that having not having childcare provides in their lives, not the typical things that that just make life more convenient and easy to, to live or fun to live. Yeah. Are you seeing demand going up or down on the ground since you've been offering this these services by telehealth? Well, we're starting to see the demand go up just in a, in a unique way, not necessarily by the number of people who are calling our center or who are contacting us through our website to receive services, but more through our community partners asking for how can we make these services easier for our clients to, to access. And so if you have a client or a community member, for example, who's living in a hotel, how does that person um, get connected to the distance counseling services that we're providing. So we are having to figure out with our community partners the best way to reach those community members and connect them to our services. So the, the increase is indirect, Leslie, in the sense that we're not necessarily getting more calls to our center right now, but our community partners are reaching out uh, to try to find out how we can, because our traditional methods of contacting us aren't quite adequate for um, the current needs related to the pandemic. Someone wants to find out more about CSERC. Uh, how do they do that? What you call CSERC. Yeah, we call it CSERC. All right, the Community Council and Education and Research Center. So uh, phone number, you can call us, it's 919-512-9000. And we have a voicemail there. And we, you know, we respond to that generally in 24 hours. Uh, we also have an email address, which is C-C-E-R-C, -C -E C-C-E-R-C, underscore admin, A-D-I-A-D-M-I-N dot N-C-S-U dot E-D-U. And if you have access to the internet or a computer, we have a website and it's go dot N-C-S-U dot E-D-U forward slash c -CERC. And we have a form there, a very simple form that, really just ask for contact information because one of the ways that we want to reduce or remove barriers is as long as we have your contact information, we take the lead in reaching out to clients and following up with them and walk them step by step through what they need to do to receive services from us. All right, we have lots of questions coming in by chat and let me just maybe turn back to all our panelists uh, so that we can answer them as a group or, or whoever feels it's most appropriate. Uh, one question that's just come in has to do with services for mental health patients in marginalized communities and the observation that generally the services are not as robust for those communities. Is there a strategy on a state level to begin addressing that? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that, again, the the opportunity of this pandemic is it points out um, all of our weaknesses, right? But, but that also gives us an opportunity to, to fix the system. I, I do believe that um, telehealth is gonna be a key pillar to increasing access to high quality services. Um, and we, you know, we will also as a state get back to um, Medicaid transformation. And, the exciting piece about that is truly integrating healthcare. Um, because, you know, as I say, putting the head back on the body instead of separating them, because really we are we are whole people. And so I think that will give us also a chance to um, look at quality in a new way, quality of services, and and look at be able to measure uh, whether providers are truly thinking about their 
members or their, their patients or clients as um, you know, a whole being and, and are all their physical health outcomes and, and behavioral health outcomes improving. Dr. Knudsen, I think both Blue Cross Blue Shield and DHHS are adjusting in, in their own way, trying to get toward more prevention-based services. And I wonder if you would validate that trend, but also just talk about what role it might play in the current crisis that we're facing. It's a great point. So definitely, um, we are trying to move more toward um, prevention. We uh, 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 Almost all of our efforts are focused on um, building and bolstering um, primary care, where a lot of that um, preventive treatment, and not only prevention, but also early intervention. So even if someone already has a, a disease condition um, or, or an illness, if you can intervene early, um, then you can potentially prevent, you know, worse outcomes down the road. Um, so, so Blue Cross is, is, um, is dedicated and really focused on bolstering primary care and also behavioral health for the, for those reasons. And so I think your question was, do we, do we see that that's particularly important during this time or? Yeah. Yeah. So, so exactly. So early, early identification, um, early treatment, and also prevention are, are key to slowing this pandemic. Um, and then similarly to what we, what Dr. Brown was saying at the beginning, you know, there, we already are seeing, you know, the, the mental health, the impact in terms of mental health and substance use disorders. It is likely that this is uh, just the early course of it and that it may sort of continue and even rise over the long term. And so these efforts that we're doing right now to get the word out, educate people about the, um, vulnerability in this time around, you know, increasing mental health and substance use disorders, but also how to identify those symptoms early, how to get treatment early is critically important. Around about 15 years ago, North Carolina moved away from a, a traditional community mental health system. Is this something that is on its way back as a result of recent thinking or what we're in now? You see that returning? Um, probably not in the way it, 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 it existed before, but, but that's sort of the beauty, right? We, we keep, we keep learning from things that we've done and we refine, refine the system. Um, you know, I think the, the model now is really, again, to focus on, on quality and actual health outcomes, right? To like buy healthcare, I'm not sorry, not to buy healthcare, to buy health. And, and our old system really was more focused on you know, buying healthcare services. And, and that's the exciting piece about Medicaid transformation. Um, and the way Medicaid transformation is happening, uh, it, it, it won't return to sort of our, our system of 100 county mental health departments. It, it, it instead, you know, turns into tailored plans and we will have like five to seven of them, but they will manage, um, you know, an individual's entire health, not just, they won't carve out mental health to be the separate thing. And so I think there's a lot of, I think there's a chance for that to actually be even better than what we've had in the past. Dr. Grimm, so you've been- I'd like to piggyback on that. Go ahead. Yeah, so, and I think just like you're saying, so the, so the state uh, and, and Blue Cross, we're, we're, we're all aligned toward, toward buying health and, and really incentivizing the entire system to focus on improving health outcomes and, and, and helping to reduce healthcare um, expenditures. And so, um, and when we do that, it actually encourages a focus on community-based care, right? Because especially in behavioral health, by and large, the most effective treatments that we have and the most, you know, clinically effective and cost-effective treatments that we have are delivered in that community setting. And so hopefully by, you know, orienting the system to be focused more on health and cost, that we will be able to push those resources towards, um, towards better um, investment in these community-based uh, treatments. Question in the Q&A about children. We haven't talked specifically about children and, and very young children. And uh, Dr. Grimmett, wondering if, if you're hearing more about challenges that children are having during this time. Well, I, not necessarily, Leslie, because our center starts at age 14. So we, I wanna be careful and not weighing in too heavily on children in, in terms of our clinical experiences, we start with high school age age folks. So I don't I don't know a lot about that, but I do want to weigh in on some of the previous discussions about um, prevention, because 
our model in counseling and at CSERC is heavily focused on wellness and prevention. And the goal is to prevent people from getting into crisis. And so this time, this pandemic is kind of exacerbating issues that we know exist always in terms of access, but also seeing mental health as just a part of overall wellness. Normally within traditional healthcare, you have to have a mental health diagnosis in order to be reimbursed for services. At CSERT, we know that you don't have to meet the diagnostic criteria for a diagnosis in order to, to benefit from counseling. So one of the outcomes that I'm hoping to see from this is that people see counseling more as like going to the doctor, healthy eating, healthy exercise, mm -hmm. and counseling. And the crisis just makes those needs more apparent. The final thing I want to say, Leslie, is relating to some of the things I'm seeing in the chat, particularly from a person named Lori, who's making some really good points about existing problems in our healthcare system that, um, that we know about where certain people can't get access and how, um, how we need to partner with communities to 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 make those have those services located there. So Dr. Knutson said that earlier. One of the things that we very intentionally did with CSERC was have it located in the community and build the model with the people who live there so that we wouldn't be imposing kind of um, things that may not work for them. And I think going forward, we would have to do the same things, um, communicate and connect with the people who live in the communities that we want to serve so that we can actually meet those needs. Because what we've learned is that while we're trying to provide excellent services, if we don't have community input from the people who are there and to really understand what's going on with them, then we won't be able to do that. And we certainly don't wanna sacrifice the, the quality of services that anyone provides based on their background or, or their, their living situation. So it's community responsive service that you're providing. Yes, and it's, 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 it's based in mutuality. So the, the idea of um, community engagement is that people, the community members or your community partners have valuable knowledge, specific knowledge that's just as important as the researchers or the clinicians who might be coming in and maybe even more so depending on the situation. And if we don't have that um, mutual conversation going and really empowering people and having a non hierarchical approach, then we kind of reinforce the same systems that perpetuate the inequities that we're talking about. Yeah. Dr. Brown, reaction to that, or perhaps the, uh, or the, the question of children and children during this time? Yeah, I, I don't, I, um, I also am not sure that we, we know the impact on children yet. I, I think we're still trying to gather data. I mean, the, the little bit of data that we, we do have um, are from our Hope for NC lines, for example, in terms of the number of calls and, and the suicide crisis line. But obviously, young children aren't aren't making those phone calls. So, um, and 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 also, school has been disrupted too. So, I think we won't probably really see this until um, kids are back in the classroom, and um, and there may be a bit of a lag. Uh, in terms of what, when we see that. But I, I, it's an incredibly important question because we all sort of worry about what's gonna be the impact on this generation of the pandemic. And um, wouldn't it be wonderful if part of the impact could be that it's important that your emotional intelligence is just, and your, uh, your coping skills and self-care are, are just as important as your um, sort of academic uh, and, and financial achievements. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think there's a, there's an opportunity uh, here if if we choose to take it. Yeah, um, just uh, one one other thing that I would add there there is uh, um, there is concern that that the anxiety that parents are feeling um, and just that our world is feeling around coronavirus is 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 impacting our our kids. Um, and then one one website that I have found really helpful is is the Child Mind Institute or childmind.org, where they've done a lot of thinking around coronavirus and, and children. So that would be that might be something that if people are interested to look into. 
we'll put that up. Right. In the resource chat. And I also the, there's the National um, Center on Child Traumatic Stress that actually has some wonderful um, articles and guidelines for parents in terms of how, how to talk to your kids. Yeah. So I think we're just showing the, the line. So this is like our very early data from a state level. So from the you know suicide prevention line, there's been 325 calls on average a day from all 100 counties. So Again, this is where we are all in this together. And there is an increase in, caller, in callers reporting high anxiety, depression, um, and active suicide risk. And, and, but the good news is less than 20% require active intervention um, and, and that most callers are able to reach a, a safe, calm resolution. And, and again, that, import, that's, that sort of points to the importance of calling early <laughs> um, and reaching out when, when people are, rather than suffering with thoughts of suicide for you know, days or weeks or, uh, on end, but to reach out in the beginning, um, because it's, it's, the, it, it's and, and two, it says it's like two thirds of the calls were first time callers. So that's actually also encouraging to me because it means people are trying to, to reach out. And then um, in our Hope for NC, this is data as of May 12th. So we, you know, we keep going, but th that's been 20 calls a day. So I I'd like to see more than that because I, I think that, that there are likely more residents in North Carolina um, that could benefit from um, just checking in with someone and, and potentially linkage to care. Um, there's been, you know, 62 crisis council referrals. And so our LMEMCO system is our, our behavioral health system on the, on the Medicaid side. And then for Hope for Healers, it was uh, only, 60, only 69 calls by the, the 12th. And, and I, I'm guessing that will go up. Again, we need to act, we, we need people need to know that this resource exists, but also as, um, as we start to lessen some restrictions and reopen and there's, and, and particularly for healthcare providers, as there's a little bit of a calm after this initial huge surge, uh, it's gonna be really important to, to reach out to maintain sort of the stamina through this event get closer to wrapping up, let me ask each of you to just give a quick observation. If, if you were given a magic wand, and I realize the state of North Carolina doesn't issue those, but if you were given one and could wave wave it and make one thing change that, that you've learned either as a result of this crisis or that you've been wanting to have happen to the mental health system uh, here, what would that be? Mark, let me maybe start with you. Thank you, Leslie. Well. I would say as a member of the community and, and maybe somewhat selfishly, I would have centers like CSERG not struggle for funding. And I think we're a very modest investment for a very high impact delivering services to people and, and the quality of services to people that you just can't get anywhere else. So I would hope that our, our states or our universities would invest in more in these university centers that have community partnerships so that we can deliver world-class services to everyone, but particularly people who wouldn't otherwise have those. Thank you. Dr. Brown, realizing you have to be careful about waving magic wands, what would, what would be one thing you would change? No, this is actually the easiest question you've asked all day. Hands down, Medicaid expansion. We need to be an expansion state. We need, to, we, this is our chance to protect this whole generation for the future in terms of access to healthcare. Um, so that, so yeah, hands down. <laughs> it's really been, it was something the department was fully in support of before, but I think the pandemic just, brought, the level of urgency is even, is even higher. Mm -hmm. Dr. Knudsen, you've been seeing a lot of data coming in. You've been seeing a lot of, uh, you've been hearing some of the chat that's come in over this. Uh, what's one thing you, you think needs to be changed over the long term as we try to recover from this and come out better? So agree completely um, with, the, with the statements that were already made. Um, I would, the, the thing that I would add is I, I really hope that this increase in the use of telehealth for behavioral health is here to stay. Um, it's, we've known we need to do this for a long time. It is as effective, this through telehealth, we can make care more convenient and, and, and effective for people. 
um, so they can actually access care. And then like we were talking about earlier, it extends this limited supply of behavioral health providers that we have um, over a, to, to meet a larger demand. All right, as we close, I realize that we've, we failed to show the slide with contact information for Dr. Brown. I wanted to show that as we, as we head out so that people can know how to uh, stay in touch with her if they have specific questions. Um, so you'll see her email and phone number, as well as the sort of overarching coronavirus uh, page that DHHS has, has created. Um, so those are available to you. Um, if you can't, don't have time to get the entire URL down, I think going to dhhs.gov, uh, you'll yep. be able to find that pretty easily. So that's uh, our show for today. I would like to thank our guests, uh, Kate Knudsen, Chief of Behavioral Health for Blue Cross Blue Shield, North Carolina, Dr. Carrie Brown, Chief Medical Officer in Behavioral Health at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, and Dr. Mark Grimmett, Head of the Community Counseling Education and Research Center in the College of Education at NC State University. We thank you all for being with us. We really, really appreciate your time. Thanks to all of you for your good questions and chat on this. Next week, we hope that you'll join us for a special discussion called The Way Back from Unemployment, Jobs, School, and Service. Our guests will be Congressman David Price, uh, who has introduced a bill to dramatically expand national service. Some of you may know that the Institute for Emerging Issues is leading a program called Service Year NC. We'll check in with him on the status of that legislation. We'll hear from Jeff Frederick, who is president of the State Association of Workforce Development Boards, uh, about their role in helping people to return to work. And from Dr. Laura Leatherwood, who's president of Blue Ridge Community College and a member of the President's Recovery Task Force. We want to hear from you about your concerns and interests so that we can find people to answer your questions. If you have an idea for a future show, we ask that you please email me at lnboney at ncsu.edu. First and Future Connecting in Crisis will be back next week. We're sponsored all this week uh, and all this month by Lowe's, the home improvement retailer. We're really grateful for their support. First and Future, Connecting in Crisis is produced by Greg Hedgepath and James Herrick. Kirsten Chang helps us get the word out and keeps the chat lively during these encounters. We hope that you will help us to be here next week and each week at the same time until at least the end of June. If you're interested in other emerging issues that the Institute's working on, you can go to our website, emergingissues.org. Finally, we had help this week from Renee Potts with slides, help on research from Simone Coleman and Trishel Moore. I'm Leslie Bowie. Stay safe and well. See you in the future.